Welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. Today is a special episode. We are joined by a very special guest. Our special guest is Dr. Kieran Kennedy, who's a registered medical doctor and practicing psychiatry registrar, working and living in Melbourne, Australia, the most livable city on the planet, with degrees in psychology, human physiology, one of my favorites, and med surge. So Kieran is passionate about all things health with a particular focus and expertise in mental health and neurology, which is why we have Kieran on today. Alongside his medical work, Kieran has made moving outside the traditional medical box a mission with an aim to break down barriers and advocate for health of body and mind combined. His pursuits in sport, exercise, bodybuilding, and fitness modeling help fuel his firm belief that fitness on the outside begins on the inside. And I totally agree. With a fresh knack for converting evidence-based medical issues into everyday language, Kieran has become a sought-after medical contributor, speaker, and author within domestic and international media. You may have seen him on Channel 10's Studio 10, Channel 9's The Today Show. He has been featured on the front cover of Men's Health magazine for Australia, and you should see it. He looks gorgeous. Women's Health, I F and Love Science, Women's Day, The Health of uh, Wellness, the House of Wellness, WebMD, and GQ Australia. My God, Kieran, how many things have you been on? <laughs> Mate, I don't know if you can see it through the screen here, but I'm, I'm going a shade of red. You've been, <laughs> you've been far, far, far too much laying it on there. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, I was, I was showing Matt the, the, your front cover of Men's Health magazine, and uh, I recommend everybody Google Men's Health magazine Australia and look at the – is it the most recent front cover? Yeah, yeah, it's the the June uh, edition before COVID came and uh, put a bit of a halt on the media landscape. Yeah, true. Uh, yeah, I but also uh, out that have a look at the image, but probably don't follow his uh, mask wearing technique. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I've definitely had a bit of a, a bit of a bit of polite feedback from people on social media that that is not how you take off a mask. Uh, <laughs> It's okay. It shows off your your thirty two inch pythons. That's all good. <laughs> I think that was more the focus of the photo, probably rather than mask etiquette, unfortunately. So. But uh, <laughs> dude, regardless, it's no. awesome. It's very cool. Um, and thank you, you know, so I'm, much, guys, and thanks for that kind intro, and and thanks so much for having me. I'm a a big big fan of you guys and what you do in all these different spaces, and. Um, as a doctor, I'm not going to lie. I uh, upskill myself a little bit on little topics I need to refresh on now and then with, with your guys' stuff. So, thank so thank you. It's humbling to be here. Oh no, that's very kind. That that makes us feel awesome because you know that's that's why we do what we do. It's a lot of fun. Matt and I like talking about the human body and how it all works. And so, we've got you on today because this is actually a topic. So usually, anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, disease states, all that type of stuff. We're pretty good. We're, we're, we're usually on top of it, or at least as, as much as on top of it we could potentially be. But this topic, which is going to be mental health focused, particularly focusing on um, substance abuse um, and addiction, is something that we just don't have a, a good grasp of. And so we've got you in. You are our expert. Now, before we jump in, uh, can we just get a little bit, just because a lot of our listeners are... Uh, med students, nursing students, paramedic mm. students, a, a lot within the health uh, field, and they love yeah. hearing about journeys. So are you able to just yeah. give us a, a, a bit of a brief about uh, your journey to what you're doing right now? Yeah, yeah, definitely, mate. And I'll try to keep it in a nutshell. So um, play, the, play the Emmy music and <laughs> get me off the stage <laughs> if you need to. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of journeys as to, to here and doing my dream job in a way, um, I'm initially from New Zealand. You can probably tell from the, the mumbly accent. Um, so I'm from like a small farming town initially. Uh, and I guess always grew up just being much more into the books and the schoolwork um, as opposed to the rugby field and stuff initially. Uh, so you know, fell in love with biology and chemistry and stuff at high school pretty early, um, went to uni and did a first year paper in psychology uh, and just absolutely fell in love with it. I uh, was just fascinated by 
how people tick, you know, what are emotions, social psychology and group behavior, neuropsychology, all that stuff um, became a full on brain sort of psych nerd. Um, and so did neurophysiology and psychology uh, as a Bachelor of Science initially. Um, and then from there, for my sins, decided that I would uh, jump onto another five years of study and, and do medical school. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of been a journey through, you know, so loving. Your... Mm? Sorry. What was that? Sorry, about. Was your intention to do medicine to go down the, the psychiatry path straight away? Yeah, I kind of always knew that I wanted to do psychiatry. Um, at the end of my psychology, physiology degree, I um, applied for clinical psychology and medical school at the same time. Like I knew that that's what I sort of wanted to do. Um, but medical school felt like the route for me. Um, it kept my options open, but it also meant that I could combine you know, the physical and the psychological. And that's what I've always loved. Um, earlier on, I, you know, I was a bit, a uh, little bit artsy during high school as well. So I've done a lot of writing and speaking, a little bit of acting. Um, so for me, psychiatry just has always felt like the sweet spot, you know, between kind of art and science. It's, it's about talking and connecting with people. It's a little bit more gray than some of the other areas of medicine, like surgery. Um, so yeah, it just, it fits for me. I think we're going to come back to that point later on, because I think that's a, that's a, a, a that statement that you've made about it's sort of a lot of other fields of medicine. You can sort of draw a circle around it. You know, you can draw a circle around um, mm. surgery this is exactly what it is. You can draw a circle around disease mm -hmm. states and treatment options for particular diseases. But for psychiatry, you're right. It's a, it's a bit more blurry, a bit more gray. Um, yeah. And I, I would say going with that more uh, tricky. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think psychiatry is one of those medical specialties where you either love it or, you know, I won't say that people hate psychiatry. I don't see how that could be possible, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think you either love it or like you say, you find it a bit, a bit too gray, a bit too uncomfortable. The edges are a little bit too fuzzy. Um, but for me, that's what I love. You know, it's never, you know, it's never a, a clear cut sort of simple situation where you can just cut something out or, you know, prescribe a, a, a miracle cure medication. Um, yeah. Sometimes I wish I could do that, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a lot more gray. It's nitty gritty. It's, it's tricky. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think let's jump into it. So like, like I said earlier, the topic for today is going to be talking about substance abuse or drug abuse and addiction. Um, yeah. So the very first question we want to ask is what is drug addiction and drug abuse and mm. what are the differences if there are any differences? Can yeah. I add tolerance as well into it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Super, super good questions. And, you know, I think starting with this stuff sort of helps ground us in further discussion about this. Um, and, I mean, interestingly, how we diagnose issues with substances now has kind of gotten rid of some of the separation there. So early on, we used to have formal different diagnoses for addiction or dependence versus abuse. Whereas now we've kind of the new diagnostic and statistic statistical manual, um, the, the DSM, which is what we use in psychiatry to diagnose things has kind of wrapped them all up together. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But broadly, addiction slash dependence on a substance is a repetitive pattern of use, whether it's alcohol, it might be methamphetamine, it might even be caffeine is in there as well. That's a diagnosis. Um, it's a repetitive pattern of use of a substance, which leads to physiological, behavioral, psychological means of kind of reinforcing and repeating that behavior and use. Whereas substance abuse can occur even just on a one-off. So substance abuse is when a single instance of using a substance leads to potential mental and physical risks. Um, so technically abusing a substance could be when we go out and have a, a big, big night out on the town and have a lot to drink. Whereas addiction or dependence comes from repeated 
use of a substance to the point where it starts to change some of the chemistry in the brain and change some of the ways we behave and, and think and feel as well. So in saying that, what would you say are the most commonly uh, uh, drugs that are probably individuals are most, I was going to say most abused, but we could talk about what drugs individuals are most addicted to and are probably most abused in Australia. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, the really, really kind of fascinating thing here as well is that technically a drug is anything that changes the, the neurochemistry and the biology in the brain. So when we think about the most commonly used substances or drugs worldwide, caffeine, for example, is, is sort of among the tip top. Um, and technically that is classed as a drug. And as I say, it's, it's in our old, um, shrink doc uh, diagnostic manual as well. I can't say I've ever diagnosed someone with a coffee addiction or a caffeine disorder, but yeah, a drug is technically anything that we're taking in and using that changes the chemistry of the brain and how we're sort of thinking, feeling and behaving. Um, so that's a biggie, but alcohol, cannabis, um, cocaine, um, those are probably the, the top tier or the top three in Australia and New Zealand, at least in terms of drugs that we're using and abusing sort of more regularly. And it's interesting. I, I don't know who said it, but I remember hearing somebody say, um, I wake up in the morning, I take my upper drug. And then in the evening, I take my downer drug and the upper obviously referring to their coffee and the downer referring to their wine or beer. Yep. Um, and so yep. everyone not, I shouldn't say everyone, a lot of people tend to be self-medicating without realizing, um, myself yeah. included, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie there. Um, particularly with caffeine. Um, yeah. I don't have a lot of caffeine, but I wouldn't be able to start the day unless I had a coffee and, and that's, and I don't know whether that's, and I'm sure there is the, uh, like you were saying, the, the new neurochemical, uh, in, interchange that's happening there. Um, but also my patterning. I like to wake up. I like to put mm. the machine on. I like to make a coffee. I like the, but the, the whole feel of sitting down with a coffee and starting my work. It's sort of as though, you know, I'm, I R hit ritual. the gong. It's a ritual. I hit the gong yeah. and the day has begun. A hundred percent. And I mean, that's the really, really interesting thing. And for me as, you know, a doctor working in psychiatry, the fascinating thing about substance use and, and drug use is that it's not purely a physical neurochemical thing. There, there are a lot of bits and pieces around, as you say, even a single caffeine hit in the morning, which, which I'm a big fan of as well. A lot of it is behavioral, you know, it's part of our ritual. It's part of our routine, just like our shower and our, you know, cereal is uh, a lot of it is psychological as well. You know, even psychologically, you starting your day being like, oh, I haven't had my long black. Psychologically, there are just bits and pieces to this that is actually separate from what your, your neurotransmitters and chemicals are doing in the brain when you have that caffeine hit. So it's, it's really fascinating. So, so, so in saying, sorry, Matt, I know you're going to ask a question, but really quickly, in saying that, because there's this interwoven relationship between the, what the drug is doing chemically, but also the, the cultural aspect, the psychological aspect mm -hmm. and everything like that. When somebody comes in to see you um, and they may have a dependence on a drug, uh, mm -hmm. do you as a, as a physician um, need to identify all those components in order to break that addiction? Do you need to, as opposed to just going, look, yes, you're addicted to a substance and it's changing you chemically. Do you need to say, well, a lot of your behaviors are actually um, coming into play here. And so if you change behaviors, it may make it easier to break your addiction to the substance. How, how do you work within all those different aspects? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really complex and it's really tricky. Um, and, you know, actually treating, especially significant substance use struggles is, is one, of, one of our biggest challenges in psychiatry and, and within addiction medicine. You know, it can be really hard to shift some of these patterns of use and, and it can be hard to shift an addiction because it's often, you know, it's, it's not one thing happening. It's a whole complex array of different things. Um, um, you know, so patients will often say to me, for example, well, that's fine, but all my friends use it. So, you know, if I want to stop using it, are you kind of telling me that I have to just dislocate myself from all my friends? 
or people might say, yeah, but my, my parents use it. So how do I not use it if I'm at home at night and, and other people are using? So that's an example of just as you say, mate, you know, it's, it's not purely a chemical thing that's happening. It's, it's, a, it's a social thing. It's a behavioral thing, a psychological thing. And that does make it really tricky to treat. And you do, you have to hit all the different aspects of it to really get something to shift long term in someone's life. What about the personality aspect to it so do people say to you look this is just how i am i'm addicted i've got an addicted mm. personality i just do things and i'm all in on it and this mm. is just another one yeah yeah definitely you know and the, the fascinating thing there is that the science kind of backs up some of that you know we know there are a whole lot of different things that for all of us um, contribute towards how, I guess, at risk we might be of using substances and then becoming addicted to different substances. Um, and there's some genetics in that. So different genetics and family histories mean that someone might be more at risk than someone else of using a substance and then becoming addicted to it. Um, and then just as we've already said, there are all those other little boxes that contribute towards someone's risk of using drugs, but also then potentially becoming dependent on them. And that might be, they've got trauma in their background. That might be personality wise. They are more open to quelling anxiety and distress with substances that make them feel good in the moment. Uh, it might be that they're going through significant stresses in their life right now and using substances or drugs as a way to kind of escape that even for a short amount of time. So yeah, there are a whole lot of different things. And people do say that, that this is just me. I find it really hard to not go whole, whole hog, hog in something and, and kind of use it again or use more and more of it. Um, and different people are different in that regard. Again, even when it comes down to our basic biology, some people's reward circuits in the brain fire up so much more when even with a cup of coffee compared to other people. Um, and that's why, you know, we're all a little different in how we respond to these things and how at risk we are of kind of using them longer term. So would you say, um, and I don't want you to paint with too many broad strokes here because I know that any time you talk generalities, you're going to be wrong in some, mm. some degree. But would you say that yeah. most people who come in um, are using their drug to mask something underlying or using it as some sort of way of self-medicating? may not necessarily know why they're doing that. But do you think that there's, from, in most cases, there's always something underpinning why they're taking that substance. Yeah, and I mean, as you say, mate, there, there are a lot of different theories about why people might turn towards using alcohol and drugs, and there are a lot of theories around what leads to addiction and reinforces addiction. Um, but, you know, I'm a firm believer, again, on that sort of psychology, physiology kind of mashup that we do with psychiatry. You know, I am a big believer that there's always a psychological component to these things. And I think one of the most common things when we're using substances, even for those of us that, you know, aren't using it in a dependent or addictive type way, you know, there is an element of um, distraction in it, avoidance of distress and anxiety, you know, in the short term, um, different substances often take us away from difficult things that we're experiencing at the moment. And so I think that is a big part of it for a lot of people. And, you know, again, the, the statistics and the science shows that too. So at least 50% of people who have an addiction or a substance use issue have at least one other diagnosable mental health condition. So, you know, a significant proportion of people who are really, really struggling with alcohol or drugs have another condition comorbid alongside that. It might be depression, it might be anxiety, it might be PTSD and trauma. Um, and there's always an interaction there. And I think that is an important part of it as well in terms of helping people cope with their reality by kind of disconnecting them from reality slightly when we're using a drug or when we have that high going on. So when you um, treat, do you treat... Uh one before the other? Is it concurrently? Do you, do you say, well, once this is treated, the addiction on the substance is likely to go away? Or do you go, well, 
it may be underpinned by this behavior or this issue, but there's still mm. a chemical dependence on this drug. You know, how do you, how do you pass that issue? How do you go in and address? I assume it's different for every individual, but is there a standard approach that you take? Yeah. I mean, I think pointing out that it's, it's, you know, as, as is nearly everything in psychiatry, it's, it's very individual. It depends on what the substance is. It depends on the severity of it. You know, for some people, the physical factors like, um, and we can delve into this a little bit more, Matt asked before, but, you know, for some people, things like tolerance and withdrawal and physical addiction might be more of an issue. Whereas other people, the social and behavioral parts of an addiction might be the most prominent features. It might be more the social aspects of it or the behavioral aspects of it. So it's always tailored as to what the substance is and what the biggest points are for someone. But generally, yeah, generally with drugs and alcohol, we take a detox type approach first. So often it's about helping someone reduce and not always, but often stopping use and making sure that that's done safely and gradually so that people don't put themselves at risk from withdrawal side effects as the substance leaves their brain and their body. And then after that, it usually comes to the longer term psychological, social, behavioral kind of means of tackling this addiction. Um, and so that's why, you know, you'll often hear, you know, people talk about detox versus rehab. And detox is often that initial first period where someone is coming off or coming down off the substance. And they often need a lot of direct medical input, again, depending on the substance, because certain substances can be quite dangerous to come off. So alcohol, for example, can actually be really dangerous if, if someone's drinking large amounts and then completely stops. And then after that, we often talk about and addiction medicine rehabilitation, which is helping someone change aspects of how they deal with anxiety, for example, or how they approach social situations if they're not going to drink anymore, but they're still, you know, out and about or going to a bar. How do they stop themselves from reaching for a drink again? Um, yeah, so broadly, we do separate the two out, but it's always a bit of an ongoing process and chopping and changing and, and taking an individual approach. Do we know the stats on, and I'm just throwing this out at you with no preparation, so I apologize there, but do we know the stats on relapsing? So individuals who come in, they go through this, so they detox, then they go through rehabilitation. You help them identify underlying issues. You help treat those underlying psychological behavioral issues. Do we know what percentage of these individuals that you would say go through a successful detox and successful rehab, then jump mm -hmm. back onto the substance? Yeah. It's, it's different for different substances, um, but the rates are pretty high, you know, so often rates of relapse, again, depending on the type of substance someone's had an addiction to and how severe that was, uh, you know, someone with a severe substance addiction, let's say they've got a significant addiction to heroin and they've been using for many years they successfully go through detox. They successfully go through a period of rehabilitation. I mean, not to, to make it sound all doom and gloom, but the, the rates of relapse in that situation are pretty high, sort of over 50%, for example. But interestingly, the rates of relapse go down each time someone goes through that process. And okay. in the same way, smoking cessation, you know, we often hear, you know, there's those ads on TV even, you know, it, it takes more than one time to quit. You know, it's the same type of flavor is here as well. You know, people often need to go through a number of, of these processes um, to ultimately achieve long-term abstinence. But again, it's very individual. Some people might do it once, it clicks, that's it. Um, but generally, yeah, rates of relapse are pretty high, which kind of coincides with a lot of our mental health disorders as well. You know, relapse of depression and anxiety are fairly high too. Um, and so a lot of these things are lifelong type struggles that people really need support with and need to sort of manage sort of in and out as they sort of come into struggles across their life. So as we begin to realize that... Um you know, the, the role that genetics plays in certain diseases and disorders is starting to become more apparent, not necessarily more influential, just more apparent in the, probably the complexity of it, that genetics is not always, it's quite rarely um, uh, uh, 
definitive. It, it doesn't tell you your fate, but it can underpin the likelihood or risk of getting certain diseases or yeah. disorders. Um, do, do you find that individuals, and I'm not sure what role genetics is playing with it. This is probably the question I'm asking. At the moment, what role is genetics playing within psychiatry? Is it Obviously, you're aware that um, genetics underpins risk and likelihood and you know, can carry on within familial lines. But is it something within psychiatry that plays a big role at the moment? I mean, I guess in our everyday clinical work, not overly. You know, I think psychiatry is a really, really interesting beast because we're a little bit behind a lot of other medical specialties in a way. And I think that's because, you know, as we said right at the start, we're dealing with kind of pretty tricky, pretty grey kind of things. And in some ways we can't, unfortunately, you know, make an incision down the middle of you and pull out your, you know, (laughs) your, your, depression kind of organ yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's tricky but the other fascinating thing about working in this sphere is that you know we're, we're getting new information and, and things so quickly now um, and genetics is a big big sort of frontier of psychiatry that we're starting to learn more and more about um, a lot of conditions we know that there is a significant genetic component so you know some disorders for example bipolar disorder or ADHD and autism you know we know that there are significant genetic contributions to that so if a family member has one of those conditions a relative a first degree relative will have significantly increased risk of getting that same condition at a much lower level, we know that the same is true for, for addiction as well. You know, there are familial lines, there are genetic components, but just like you said, mate, it's kind of teased into this big boiling pot of different risk factors that mm. kind of come out to ultimately sort of put someone in their different tier as to how at risk they might be of getting that condition. Um, and it's a bit, it's a bit kind of uh I mean, I was just going to say it's a bit nerdy, but it it shows how much of a nerd I am that I get excited talking about it because I just find it fascinating. But um, we talk about the stress diathesis model in psychiatry. So we talk about biological risk factors that put someone at this level, for example, that might be your genetics, your family history, the biology in your brain that kind of puts you at a certain set point. And then if we go through trauma or mental health struggles, family issues when we're younger, that might bump up sort of the risk to the next notch. If we then go through different events in our life, like having a loved one pass away, losing a job, um, that can bump up our risk. And then there are almost different lines. And when we hit above a line, uh, that's when, for example, someone might fall into a depression and obviously that's extremely simplistic but it kind of shows all these different things genetics biology life history social history they all kind of notch up on top of each other yeah 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 so so do you find that your job again talking simplistically do you find that your job is sort of releasing the valve on that and just letting some of that you know if it is Mm -hmm. the analogy of filling that cup just releasing some of that and letting it out do you do you see that your job is to bring it down to zero or is your job just to release it a little bit or help them identify strategies of being able able to bring it down yeah i I love that um analogy actually i might steal that metaphor mate but um (laughs) (laughs) emptying the cup um but no i think it i think it is about like you say wherever we can trying to yeah remove some of the water from that bucket um and for certain conditions we can do that on the biology side you know we might have medications that we can use to influence and alter the neurochemistry in a helpful way to to bring that level of water down in the cup a little bit Um, and in other ways it might be psychological um, therapies or inputs it might be social supports and behavioral means and I think for addiction again the, the overall here is that it's a bit of a melting pot where we often help support someone through this by yeah releasing valves and letting some of the water out on all those different parts when and if we can great now addiction Drug addiction versus behavioral addiction. So somebody addicted Mm -hmm. to heroin, for example, or somebody addicted to gambling. Um, And this might lead into talking about some of the the neurochemistry involved. But is 
is, is all addiction created equally? Is it all hijacking the same neurochemical pathways? Would you treat somebody with um, a, a heroin addiction similarly to somebody with a gambling addiction? So firstly, how is it perceived clinically? How is it defined? And yeah. what about the chemistry? Yeah, Re- really, really fascinating question because especially in modern society, I think this is trickling in more and more. You know, now we're, we're seeing things crop up about internet gaming addiction or disorder shopping addiction sex addiction all these different things and as you say is that the same as now hey different types of addictions jumping Mm. into the diagnostic manual yes yes so um we've got gambling disorder within the dsm um and there are other kind of provisional diagnoses that don't quite yet have enough evidence yet to be full diagnoses but they're under research and i I wouldn't be surprised if when our next dsm our diagnostic manual comes out there will be a lot more addictive type disorders in there so there's already a lot of research behind sex addiction Um, online or gaming type addictions, uh, shopping addiction. um, And yeah, I mean, the fascinating thing is that the neurobiology and the chemistry behind any kind of addiction, there are solid similarities there. uh, And most of it comes down to the reward pathways in the brain. So is all this sort of sitting in within the dopaminergic system and, and because the way I like to talk about it with my students, when I talk about dopamine and reward is that, Anytime you do something that you like doing, dopamine's the reason why. It doesn't matter what it mm-hmm. is. If you go back and you do it again, it's all because of dopamine. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, you can see in certain uh, disease states like Parkinson's disease where the dopaminergic pathways sort of started to um, degenerate and the dopamine-producing neurons start to die off that mm. these individuals are, you know, less animated. Dopamine obviously plays an important role in, in movement, smoothing movement, mm-hmm. beginning initiating movement and so forth. But when they get their treatment with dopamine, some of the side effects include addiction, which just yeah. highlights nicely that the dopamine pathway play, plays that role. So um, would you say that dopamine is playing a role in, in all aspects of, of drug addiction and behavioral addiction that, it, that we're just hijacking that system? Mm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the foundations to any kind of addiction. Like you say, it's a, it's a repeat system of behavior driving things because of that incredibly powerful positive reinforcement at at our very basic sort of biology level. Um, And so, as you say, all those dopaminergic reward pathways, that is one of the kind of the common denominators for any type of addiction at a neurochemistry level. So, you know, if we start with the dopamine neurons in the the ventral tegmental area of the midbrain and the brainstem, that fires off projections to parts of the cortex. And then we've got the limbic system as well involved in emotions and, and behavioral reinforcement. You know, that's the stuff that, as you say, mate, whether it's getting that little Bing uh, Instagram notification sound on our phone, whether it's having sex, whether it's having a cup of coffee, we, we get that kind of hit, even if we're not consciously aware of it, we get this little dopamine hit that says you've had a reward and it's incredibly powerful at setting up these repeat patterns of behavior so that the brain can lock us into doing things that ultimately it thinks are about our survival. Um, you know, so all of these pathways obviously go right back to when sex, eating, going to the toilet, making social connections, um, you know, out in the caves and back on the savannas, yeah. you know, thousands of years ago, those things became so locked in through dopamine pathways because that's what led us to survive. And in the same way, substances like alcohol and drugs, but also things like shopping, potentially gambling, they're hacking into that same system. And that's why it's incredibly difficult to start to shift these things when they become locked into those reward circuits. So when does it spill over to be a problem? So if this is important for everything we do, for our own survival for every day, like Mike said, he gets up, has a coffee, it starts his day, he can then go and do his work. 
Um, or I'm on Instagram for eight hours. <laughs> but when it, <laughs> He's just thirsting over those Instagram notifications. No, waiting for the ding. Actually, I, I don't have notifications <laughs> turned on because that would, that would be Ooh, too much. Wise but, move, mate. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's true. I, I, I do wait for the – when I open it up, I, I know that I'm getting hijacked there. I know that when I'm on caffeine. But Matt's point's good. When does it spill over to become a, an issue? Is it only when it yeah. becomes kind of destructive, like behaviours mm. and – relationships you know mm-hmm. law-breaking behavior is it that's when you see it as an yeah, issue definitely you know and if we strip it right back to our diagnostic criteria the interesting thing now with the the new dsm is that it just has one diagnostic kind of grouping that we apply to all substances. So whether we're diagnosing someone with an alcohol use disorder, a methamphetamine use disorder, even in some ways, it's slightly different, but a gambling disorder, there are kind of these common denominator diagnostic criteria that we use to diagnose someone. And you're exactly right, Matt. It it comes down to some of the biological things. So a big part of it is tolerance and withdrawal. And these, these are through physical processes that are happening in the brain. Tolerance is when we need more of a certain substance to get the same high or the same effect. So Matt might have initially, I mean, so Mike might have initially, you know, got super jacked up getting, um, you know, 10 Instagram followers a day. Now he needs 20. Now he needs 30. Now he needs his current, which is probably 5,000 a day, whatever it is. Um, (laughs) But so tolerance is when we're kind of needing biologically in the brain, the brain habituates to a certain level and it needs a certain higher level to get the same response. And then we've got withdrawal, which is the chemistry in the brain has changed because of the presence of alcohol or drugs. And when that substance is suddenly taken away, the brain's almost like a baby having its bottle pulled away from it. It doesn't quite know how to cope. So we start to get withdrawal symptoms. So So I'd like to come back to that um, issue with withdrawal. But the first question before we get to that is just about why, why are some things more heavily abused? Is it just because of the level of dopamine? So for instance, Mm. are there some medications that just release a huge amount, let's say like ice um, or you know, why don't people necessarily abuse blood pressure medication or um, antibiotics, things like that? Yep. No, and um, you're definitely spot on there, mate. Like some of the basics around what makes something inherently addictive or not is often down to how it hits the neurochemicals and the receptors in the brain and how quickly and powerfully it does that. So substances that absorb very quickly and act very quickly and powerfully to, you know, set off our dopamine circuits like a pinball machine, they are often more physiologically addictive than substances that kind of wire up those circuits less powerfully. Interestingly, the shorter a substance has a duration for that also makes that substance more addictive. So the biggies are substances that absorb quickly, you know, rocket up our dopamine levels. So they feel Mm. incredibly rewarding for a brief period of time. And then they lose their effect quickly because that sets up a, a pathway in the brain where the brain says, Holy crap, that felt great but it was over really soon. I need to do it again and again and again to get the same kind of hit. And is there any truth to the claim that you sometimes hear that some um, drugs that you take, you have it once and then you're addicted and it's nothing you can do. Or does that again come down to the individual that's just for some, it wouldn't really matter what it is. They just have a genetic underpinning or something that then it would be very difficult for them. Like maybe you can use nicotine as an example or heroin. Mm, Yeah. And I think, again, all those other things really importantly come into play. You know, what someone's genetic risk is, what their family history is, what they've been through in their life in terms of trauma, anxiety, maybe other mental health issues that kind of all, like we said before, go into that melting pot to determine someone's risk of becoming addicted to a substance. Um, But interestingly, different substances do have different risk potentials. So um, heroin, uh, methamphetamine, I mean, you know, these substances absorb very quickly. They 
have an extremely powerful reward generating reinforcing process in the brain. So those are examples of substances that people can become addicted to reasonably quickly. Um, and methamphetamine is one of those substances that people can have one, two, three times and they're locked in. It's incredibly hard from there, even biologically in the brain to stop using that um, substance. So do you know, um, I mean, this is probably a difficult question to put you on the spot with, but say with animal models where let's say like mouse models or rat models where you might be able to screen or control out for cultural, social personality mm -hmm. aspects that we can't as humans. But if you give them a drug, they may get addicted instantaneously or mm -hmm. almost with one dose. Do you have any idea of that? I mean, I don't have any idea of the exact specifics there, but, but definitely, you know, I, th I am aware of studies, you know, that have, have, done that on a very basic level with people you know we've, we've tried to standardize out you know history risk factors like trauma or other mental health related impacts other social impacts um, you know and even with kind of uh, pet scans and things you know we can see how how much a different sort of substance or even a different form of the same substance lights up our reward circuits and our dopamine pathways. And we do know that, that those things correlate pretty closely at times to how likely someone is to become addicted from that substance, even as you say, after a single kind of go. So yeah, it's, it's pretty scary stuff. When we look at withdrawal, so I, I did a video on alcohol withdrawal and some of the neurochemistry underpinning it. I just want to clarify whether I'm right. <laughs> I just want to know whether, obviously it's oversimplistic, but the way I spoke about it was that, you know, you've got excitatory neurochemicals and inhibitory, you know, you've got, you got GABA, it mm -hmm. drops things down, it inhibits things, you've got glutamate, it excites things. And yeah. so I, I stated that it, with alcohol abuse, um, because it's inhibitory predominantly, GABA boosts up, glutamate drops down and the brain wants to manage a balance. So I spoke about it in regards to a seesaw. And so if GABA goes up, glutamate goes down, it tries to bring the glutamate back up and drop the GABA down. So what it does is it increases the amount of glutamate receptors and drops down the amount of GABA receptors. And then somebody with an addiction who abuses alcohol over time sort of has the, the neurochemistry is altered, but the seesaw has tipped in a way so that it remains as balanced as possible and then when you remove the alcohol what happens is you're going back to the brain without alcohol but there's so many glutamate receptors now and so little GABA that the brain over excites and this is what results in somebody having seizures for example and all mm -hmm. these other other issues um, would you say that that's fair in a way that the brain is actually getting rewired. You're changing the amount of receptors. You're changing the way chemicals are being released. Um, and therefore, it, you're actually having physiological adaptations. 100%. Yep. And, okay. and when we talk about withdrawal, that is what physical withdrawal comes down to. It's like you say, with repeated uh, significant amounts of a substance, it rewires the brain. And again, I geek out about this and find it fascinating, but it's amazing that the brain actually, as you say, seesaws itself to reach a state of equilibrium again, where things are balanced out. So it's kind of like while alcohol's there and if someone is drinking every day, you know, significant amounts, alcohol is kind of, as you say, man, acting as this artificial break. It's kind of like a foot on a break within yeah. the brain kind of increasing the inhibitory kind of pathways through those GABA um, receptors, as you said. And so there's an extra inhibitory effect. And so, as you say, the brain says, well, we need to reach our kind of equilibrium state. So it ramps up the excitatory receptors and pathways in the brain, and it ramps down the natural GABA within the brain because it's like, well, we've got this big alcohol foot on the brake, yeah, so we, we don't need we don't need our own natural GABA receptors and natural inhibitory circuits to work so hard anymore. And then if you pull that foot away, there's nothing pushing the brake down. 
and all of those excitatory pathways kind of have free reign mm. and the brain is just ramping up without the natural GABA and inhibitory pathways being there to hold it back. And we get seizures, we get sweats, heart rate goes crazy, people get diarrhea, their gut function goes all over the place. And, you know, the same thing happens with heroin and opiates as well. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask that, so similar for all the... Oh, okay. mm. And wow. yeah, so not every substance gets a physical withdrawal. Um, but yeah, it, that, it's kind of that same premise for all the ones that do. Uh, and for opioids like morphine or heroin, the withdrawal side effects we get when we come off those things uh, is mainly due to norepinephrine or noradrenaline. In that same way, when the heroin's no longer there, the foot's not on the brake. So the noradrenaline receptors start going crazy and people get nauseous, vomiting, diarrhea, sweats, runny Does nose, that runny more eyes. Actions, that, that it exacerbates if they've got underlying anxiety, that getting off the drug probably has exacerbated their anxiety than what it was prior to them taking the drugs. Would you say yeah. it, it can actually worsen those underlying symptoms? Definitely. Yeah. And this is, you know, a really powerful point that I often talk to people about is that, you know, the, the, the seductive thing about alcohol and drugs, you know, even at a non-addictive type level is that in the short term, they often make us feel good. And because of the pinball pieces of the brain, they're hitting when they're in our brain, you know, they make us feel more relaxed. We sleep easier if we've had a beer before bed, it boosts our mood up a little bit because the reward circuits are clocking away. So in the short term, they can make us feel like those things are better. But in the long term, those habituating kind of long-term changes in the brain actually worsen depression, worsen anxiety. Um, so one of the first steps, if I see someone with depression, if they're drinking two or three beers a day, one of my first steps is to always try and get that off the cards yeah. because that's going to be just perpetuating and worsening the mood and anxiety problems they're going through. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating sort of neurophysiology that's going on. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I find it amazing um, considering how many Australians out there are drinking alcohol, taking other particular drugs. And, mm. you know, I think a lot of people also think that, because it's legal, it's okay. You know, the, because the government allows us to do it, they must have obviously checked that it's relatively safe for us. But statistically, mm. alcohol is one of the biggest causes of mortality and morbidity on the planet. Um, yeah. and, and, we all, and we never really a address that. Um, it's, 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 such a, it's such a big killer, but we've got shops dedicated to it down the street. Yeah. I, could go, yeah. I could go get enough alcohol to kill myself you know what, right now, mm. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a drugstore. It's, it's legitimately a drugstore that, that can kill me. And uh, it's unregulated in that sense. Yet there's obviously other many drugs which are regulated. And so this brings me to a question um, like LSD, for example, where I think the evidence shows, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, but the evidence shows that it, it isn't an addictive drug. Um, acid, for example, LSD, but it obviously plays around with the with the neurochemistry, and people are talking about its its use, maybe in micro dosing, maybe in taking mm. big trips for treating things like anxiety and depression. Now, mm -hmm. and alcohol abuse, isn't it? Potentially, yeah, for for other addictions. So, mm. using a yeah, drug yeah. to stop somebody being addicted to yeah. another drug, <laughs> um, starting to get real kind of rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my question is, you know, what are your what are your thoughts on it um, as mm. as a psychiatrist, um, or or even as a person? You know, it's it's up to you how you want to how you want to answer it. But do you think mm. that drugs like that, illicit, currently illicit drugs, have a mm. potential role within psychiatry? Yeah, it's a, it's. I mean, it's one of the big, the big questions on the lips of psychiatry uh, around the world at the moment. I think, and I think the inter the really, really interesting thing about all of this, like you said, mate, is when it comes to substances, when it comes to drugs, there's there's a big kind of there's always been a very moral, social sort of connection to things as well. Like so, just like you say, tobacco, alcohol, caffeine, 
are still technically drugs, and some of those things do significant, significant physical and mental harm, but societally they are acceptable, they are legal, they're okay, whereas other th- drugs that affect our brain and neurochemistry, sometimes in very similar ways, they are bad, they are wrong, they are naughty and they are illegal you know and and so whether it's the substance or people using substances and becoming addicted there's a lot of kind of moral type judgmental sort of lines in the sand that we jump on onto and over Um, and i think when it comes to using substances that have traditionally been you know locked in the these are bad these are illegal these hurt you these are harmful when it comes to starting to use those for possible medical benefits, it's super complex for all those different reasons. Awesome. Um, you know, we're still finding out information about it, but from what I've seen, the evidence around hallucinogens, for example, for treating things like trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, for treating anxiety, for treating depression, there is, there is some solid medical evidence behind these things potentially working in a positive, helpful way when they're used correctly and used in the proper medical settings, you know, alongside therapy. Um, I don't want people to go away thinking if they have a big acid trip at home, it's going to sort out their, their sort of trauma and anxiety. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> these are sort of very controlled things that happen alongside a therapist or a psychologist or psychiatrist, often guiding people through, through things. And it's often because under some circumstances, hallucinogens allow us to broaden and explore our feelings, our thoughts, our sensations around things. And it's thought that in some cases that can actually help the brain process and adjust to causes of anxiety, causes of trauma. Um, so it's a, it's a really fascinating thing that I think we're actually going to start using more and more in modern psychiatry, actually. So potentially watch this space. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah it'll be very – I'm interested to see wh- where it all goes because, um, you know, you look in the States and obviously marijuana now is, is quite freely available. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't kill as many people as alcohol does. Uh, it's still a drug, still alters your neurochemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the point that you made is really important. Looking at the, um, the, the ethics of drugs is interesting because mm. legalities and ethics aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, just because something's yeah. legal doesn't mean it's ethical. And yeah. there are per, per, uh, perceptions that people have about certain drugs simply because of their legal status. So mm. they automatically denote it as being bad or evil, for example. Yeah. But you know, no drug in itself is, is evil. Um, mm-hmm. uh, like you said, there may be certain drugs that have utility, but uh, all of them will be altering neurochemistry to some yeah. degree. Um, and Definitely. I don't think any of us condone taking drugs uh, without the medical supervision of, uh, of, of somebody uh, like yourself. Um, when we look at um, individuals who are coming up within medicine, nursing, Mm. whatever it may be. Um, And this is probably going to be one of our closing um, questions here. A a lot of health professionals or aspiring health professionals professionals probably don't know much about mental health. Mm. Um, Do you have any advice for them? Actually, my first question is, sorry for jumping around. Has your perception of what psychiatry is, has it changed from what you thought it was to when you went into it? Are there any myths that you think need to be dispelled or do you think, are there any important points that aspiring health professionals who want to get into your field um, would help them to know now? Mm. Oh, mate, I could ramble for for days (laughs) on this. (laughs) I get, you know, I think one of the things that, dovetails into what we were just talking about quite nicely probably is the you know the the stigma and the emotional moral ethical kind of things that we still attach to so many of the things within mental health and psychiatry you know and and some of those other things that I dabble in a little bit in terms of some of the media stuff and the the advocacy stuff that's what I get really passionate about Um, you know and, and in a lot of ways we have some of those same mental blind spots and stereotypes and stigmas for mental health in general as we do to 
drug and alcohol use. You know, back in the day, someone that we would now see as having psychosis or maybe borderline personality disorder would have been framed as being possessed or evil, being a witch. Um, yeah, and and so you know the, we've come through so many historical, you know, moral emotional attachments to what mental illness and mental health is. And I think, you know, for, for any kind of up and coming health professional, whether it's a paramedic, a doctor, a nurse, allied health, you know, I think for me, that is, that is lesson numero uno is to, to understand that mental health conditions are not necessarily something that have inherent kind of moral attachments or stereotypes to them, you know, they can happen, yes, for a whole lot of different complex reasons, but often ultimately there's a genetic, there's a biological component to things that these are not necessarily choices, these are not failings, these are not weaknesses. Um, and so I think that is, that is really, really key to keep in mind, you know, even for doctors and nurses currently working in any specialty. Um, and, and I work in an area of psychiatry where I see patients in the emergency department in surgical units on medical wards. So I think one of the biggest things I've learned about psychiatry that I love is that there's no separation, actually, you know, whatever field you go into, whether you're a nurse, a physiotherapist, a dietitian, you will be working with people where mental health is a major component to what's going on. Yeah, how do you um, separate mental health from the individual? Yeah, right? Exactly. And, and how do you separate mental health from physical health? Because yeah. the other fascinating thing that really fires me up is that we're learning more and more about how those two things sort of interact and, and dovetail again. You know, what's happening physically in our body significantly impacts on our mental health. And, you know, vice versa, you know, things even as much as mindset and mood, we know scientifically now affect rates of healing and recovery after surgery. It's fascinating stuff. So I think, I think it's all of us in health professions knowing that, you know, these aren't two separate kind of things that we can cleanly yeah. cut and, and separate out. Whatever area you're going into, you know, we need to be thinking about this stuff and knowing that it's important. Can I just ask you one question before we close? Um, yeah. so we're, you know, six to eight months in a pandemic. Um, we hear a lot about the mental health challenges in this pandemic. Yeah. I mean, you're in Victoria, so or Melbourne, yeah. so you're in a stage four lockdown and you're yeah. a psychiatrist or training psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, can you comment on your experience, how things have changed for you over the last six months? And just generally yeah. speaking, what, what do you think is going to happen in this, in this space? I'm going um, forward. Yeah, it's a, a really, really good question that I'm glad you've asked, mate. I mean, it's been a it's been a wild ride <laughs> for Victoria. Um, and you know, it, it's a bit scary, I'll be honest, to to be working as a mental health professional at the moment, seeing, hearing and feeling what people are collectively going through. Um, in Melbourne, for example, you know, some of the stats coming through are that 33% increases in people coming to emergency departments with self-harm. Um, you know, there's, there's increases in people calling lifeline, there's increases in anxiety and depression that we're already seeing and feeling in the mental health sort of space. Uh, and, and I think the scary thing for me is that we know with mental health and drug and alcohol use, what we actually see in the statistics and what I see as a mental health doctor is usually just the tip of the iceberg because there will be so many more people struggling and not presenting to emergency departments or not coming to see their GP or getting a psychiatrist referral. Um, so, you know, I think we are going to have to be very aware that the pandemic comes with a, an elephant in the room. It comes with an invisible kind of second wave or third wave, whatever you want to call it. And that is the mental health impacts of all of this. And, you know, it, it actually just fires me up and reinforces why, you know, chats like we're having on this episode now are so important because we need to be thinking about the mental and the physical here. So do you think the reason why people aren't coming to, to their GPs or presenting um, in emergency with mental health issues is because mm. of the stigma that's still associated with it? Because individuals see it as though, um, oh, well, you know, Mental health's my issue. This is me. 
Um, yeah. This isn't physical health. No one can help me with this. It's my burden to carry. Mm -hmm. But also, mm -hmm. I can't be seen as this because I may be seen as crazy. You know, everyone yeah. else is, doesn't have this issue when you'd be yeah. surprised how many people you yeah. talk to. Um, do you think, so if, if that's the case, what's the next step um, for one, a health professional, and two, somebody who's not a health professional, how do we close the gap on making mm. individuals realize that mental health is physical health? It is something that is just as important. What, do we, what can we do? Yeah, I think, yeah, like that is the question. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the parts is just like we've talked about through this chat is kind of taking some of the taking some of the moral kind of emotional attachment out of it. You know, if someone's diagnosed with gastric cancer or kidney disease, we don't necessarily kind of even subconsciously have a gut feeling that well, there must be something kind of wrong with them or, you know, they, they did something across their life that means they deserve that. They're yeah, weak. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. yeah. They're failing in some way. And we really actually need to start, tearing open the top of the lid here and saying, you know, for all the ways that we've improved in this in recent years, there is still so, so much stigma around mental, mental illness and struggling with that. Um, and a lot of it is subconscious. A lot of it's implicit. You know, you can ask people on a surface level, do you think depression is weakness? And people will say, no, of course not. But then if you do some really nifty little implicit bias type studies that psychologists like to do, it shows that still subconsciously our brains attach mental illness with weakness or with failing or with, you know, badness or wrongness or dangerousness. And so I think it's, it's just talking these things through generally in some of the bigger sort of media general community spheres to let people know that if they are struggling, it's, it's not abnormal, it's nothing personal to do with them, and that they should reach out for help. Um, I wanted to come back just really quickly. I kind of pinned it in the back of my brain to um, Matt asked before, and I think I sort of dropped off on it, you know, because I think a big part as well is how do we know when something's actually a problem here? And Matt asked before, you know, so how do we know if – you know, Mike just really likes Instagram and, and the dopamine hit he gets from it versus when does he have an Instagram addiction? You know, like I when is a struggle? Right now. It, it's an addiction. Like, like, <laughs> as soon as, as soon as my stop. Acceptance is the first step, mate. So that's beautiful. <laughs> as soon as I stop the recording, Michael run to the next room, grab his phone. <laughs> no, I don't need well, to laugh. I was going to say, I, yeah, if you've got it, I've got it, mate. So I, um, I can't talk there. Um, but I think that's an important part of this as well when it comes to mental health. It is complex. It is tricky. It's awkward. It's, it's anxiety provoking. Um, and so I think it can help for people also to know kind of what counts as, you know, what's a stressful day or a bad week and what's depression. What is I like to go out for a drink at a bar with my mates versus what is an alcohol use disorder. And generally, we talk about when it is starting to impact your life in terms of how you function and how you want to function. Um, so, for example, with alcohol and drugs, it's if it's starting to impact your relationships, your work, taking the kids to school, um, if you're starting to spend a whole lot of time directed towards getting the drug and using it if you're craving it, if it's starting to cause risky physical situations where you might be getting hurt because of the use of it. Um, these are all little red flags that go towards the diagnosis of these things to say, well, it's more than just enjoying a drink. And in some ways, the same goes for depression and anxiety. If it's starting to affect us to a degree where we can't actually do the things that we want to do, or we can't enjoy the things that we used to, and it's causing us significant distress, that is always a red flag to say, this is maybe something more than just stress and I should be getting help for it because it's a legitimate illness. It's not a failing. It's not a weakness. And so I think if people are asking the question, especially in Melbourne, especially during the pandemic, if you sit there and it bubbles up into your head, I don't know if I'm coping with this, maybe I should see the GP. That is actually the moment to say, if you're asking the question, that is the time to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. So just finally, uh, oh my. we're going to say finally about eight, <laughs> eight times because I've got so many questions. I, I love that. You, you can't shut me up questions. either. So. I think we'll just have him back 
Yeah. But anyway, um, so this, this question is kind of just continuing what you just said. So for the listeners who may have a friend or a family member that they think may have an addiction or an abuse issue with a drug, what uh, advice would you give them to kind of approach the issue? Yeah, you know, again, I think it would be trying to step back from that and, and pull out your emotional response to it, any of the stereotypes or stigmas you might have around it and approach it as you would, you know, if a family member was really struggling with something physically, you know, um, that can often help us, I think, be a little bit more empathic towards that person that's struggling and it can also help us approach it. Um, and far and away the biggest thing that I hear nearly every day at work is people saying, uh, I just didn't know how to bring it up. Or I worried that if I did ask them about it, it would make it worse. You know, we know hands down that that is a myth. If you ask about how someone's going with their alcohol use or drug use, if you ask about someone's suicide risk, if you ask about how they're feeling, you increase that person's chance of getting better and recovering so much more than you do increasing any risk. So I think it's just always to push through that discomfort and anxiety around talking about this stuff and just ask. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to do it when we have a diffuser in between. So when we're driving in the car, when we're washing the dishes, maybe if you're going for a jog or a walk with a mate, having something that's kind of happening in the background can take some of the tension and awkwardness out of it and help us start to talk and just open them with care and concern. Uh, hey, mate, I'm only asking this because I really, you know, I'm worried about you or I really care about you, but, you know, you seem to be drinking a little bit more lately. And just leave it at that. Leave it open and allow that person to start to open up however they feel comfortable. A lot of the time we feel that there's a pressure to dive in with, I've noticed you doing this or you're not doing this anymore. What about this? What are you doing with this? Yeah. You know, and that can put someone on the back foot. Yeah, it, it can make people feel defensive, attacked, and that can make it more difficult to open up. So I think... Just approach it broadly and let that person talk and know that your job is to just listen and support how you can. Your role is not to be a therapist. It's not to be a doctor. So take some of the pressure off ourselves as well um, because that can be also one of the reasons why people find it really difficult to talk about this stuff is that we worry, oh God, well, if they say that they do think they've got an alcohol problem, then what the heck do I do with that? And we don't actually have to do anything. You know, you can really support people and help improve their mental health by just listening and just doing what you can as a friend, as a parent, as a partner. You don't have to be the therapist in the scenario. And if they admit to, you know, potentially having this issue, would you then mm. just kind of suggest that they go on to the GP? Is that the best first port of call or is there a, a hotline or something that you'd recommend? Yeah, I mean, I think the GP is always a really good place to start because the GP, you know, can can ask some of those foundation questions to really start to tease out what's going on, how risky something might be, and then refer and support someone through different pathways there. Um, you know, direct line is, is a sort of uh, other places online where depending on what state you're in, people can get sort of advice of specific drug and alcohol support numbers, for example, to call for advice directly. So that's somewhere to start as well. Um, and I think wherever you reach out for help, it's, it's knowing that, you know, psychiatry is not what we often see of it in movies. Um, you know, you're not going to get, you know, chucked into a room and strapped up. You're not going to get medication forced down you. Um, so it's about knowing that, you know, just as we would if we had some weird thing going on in our tummy or if our foot had a massive weird black lump on it for two weeks, you know, we just need to be getting help with this stuff in the same way we would for our physical body and, and knowing that it's completely legitimate and safe to do that. So I think it's just reaching out and starting that journey. Awesome. Kieran, this is great. Um, I could talk to you all day, uh, which I think is a good sign that you're good at what you do. Um, so... <laughs> I, think I don't know, have... it might be a sign that I just ramble and don't make much sense. No, but, uh... not at all. No, not at all. I've, I've, I've learned a lot. I think Matt's learned a lot. I think the listeners will definitely have learned a lot. We're going to have to have you on again because I've got... Uh... Because Michael's addicted to you. 
Exactly. Yeah. Just like well, you know, I've been told before that, you know, I, I do hit some dopamine circuits. So <laughs> <that's fine. laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a bit narcissistic to say, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. I, um, well, I, I need to get my Kieran hit again. So I think we're going to have to uh, organize another one. Um, thanks so oh, much. I'd, I'd love that, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Like I say, I just, um, I really love chatting about this stuff, but also it's just, it's really, really important stuff. You know, like we need to be learning about the physiology, the anatomy, you know, we need to be learning about health and, and knowing that health also means mental health um so yeah. yeah so just thanks so much for having me on board to ramble and talk about some of this stuff guys and i'd love to do it again it was great so if if you want to reach out to to kieran he's got a brilliant instagram page all his evidence-based work he, he reaches out and he discusses all these matters daily and it's brilliant um you can reach him at Dr. D-R, Kieran, K-I-E-R-A-N, Kennedy, K-E-N-N-E-D-Y. Hope I got that right. So, did, Kieran on Instagram, um, definitely follow. Definitely follow. Um, thank you, listeners. Another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike. We'll be back soon. Thank you, Matty. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you, guys. I'll see you soon. Thanks, mate. Whew, that Great. was awesome. Thanks, guys.